78 years ago, the largest German battleship built up until that point began its first and last voyage. The mission would take less than two weeks, but would catapult the ship into naval history as one of the most recognisable names of any warship to sail the seas. It would, of course, also spark generations of ferocious debate in scholarly articles and online about practically every detail of the ship, its crew, its mission, and its opponents. Well, today we're going to tell the story of Operation Rhine, the final voyage of the battleship Bismarck. And I say we for good reason, because today we're going to tell the story slightly differently. Part story, part battle report, and told by two different people. 78 years ago, we might very well have been on opposite sides slinging shells at each other over the icy waters of the Atlantic, but today we're working together to bring you the main part of a series of related videos about this very important piece of naval history. So it is high time to welcome my co-host for this video, one Napalm Ratter. Hello, hello there. My name is Napalmrat and I am a gamer slash YouTuber from Bavaria. That's the southern part of Germany that produces the good beer. Amongst the very first World War II stories that I heard as a little boy was the first and last voyage of the Bismarck. What a fascinating story it was, and still is, and also what a name, Bismarck. Not only the name of the Iron Chancellor, but also of that one ship that dared to fight the British and nearly got away with it. Nearly. The more I read about the ship and the more I saw on TV and on the internet, the more I realized that the story of the Bismarck was bigger and many aspects in one documentary or book weren't really covered in the next one. The whole story and more details had to be brought together. Years later, games such as War Thunder and World of Warships revived my interest in this topic and I went on the internet and one day came across Strakinifal's YouTube channel. I convinced him to make a video together on this topic. A match made by the gods. A British and a German guy doing a video together about one of the most famous battles and chases in naval history. So now let's find out what are facts, what are lies and or propaganda persisting for decades. So we'll start with a bit of background. The Germans were very well aware that the UK depended on imports of all sorts of materials, both mundane and warlike, to keep itself supplied. Both world wars had seen determined efforts to break these supply chains and thus force the British Empire out of the war. The British, equally aware of this risk, had developed, or rather redeveloped, the convoy system during World War I and had made significant advances in the field of anti-submarine warfare during the interwar period. Admiral Dönitz had wanted hundreds of submarines to do this job, but at the start of the war he had far fewer than this many of which were coastal submarines that would never be able to operate in the deep Atlantic. Although more U-boats were being built, they were also being sunk at an increasingly worrying rate. So the Kriegsmarine had to try and inflict further damage on Allied shipping, using other tools at its disposal. Disguised merchant ships, so-called Hilskreuzer, heavy cruisers, Panzerschiffe, and the two battleships Scharnhorst and Gneisenau all had been deployed to this purpose with varying levels of success. One of the major issues the German raiders were facing was that with the Royal Navy being significantly larger than its opponents, whilst the Germans had to consider which use they were going to put their few battleships to, the British were simply deploying their old and less modernised battleships as convoy escorts and still keeping their modern battleships in play in operational theatres. This proved to be a highly effective deterrent against surface raiders, as even an old Revenge or Queen Elizabeth class was still more than a match for anything the Germans had sent out so far if it came down to a gunnery duel. Even the two Scharnhorsts had shied away from engaging such a ship, and whilst it's possible they might have won a battle with an old Revenge class, the resulting damage to themselves would almost certainly have seen one or both of the ships lost, either in a fight, or shortly thereafter by follow-up attacks, and the convoy most likely would have escaped. However, there was a new card in the Kriegsmarine's hand, the brand new Schlachtschiff Bismarck. Much larger and faster than the old British battleships, it was equipped with the latest German radar and fire control systems, as well as new high-power 15-inch guns with a fast reload system, when it worked. 
Such a ship could confidently engage almost any convoy escort it was likely to encounter, especially when operating alongside other vessels in a small squadron. At first, the plan was to sail in company with one or two Hipper class heavy cruisers, as well as the Scharnhorst and Gneisenau. This Mark's sister ship, Tirpitz, was still under final construction, so getting this ship into the field as well would take too much time. But British airstrikes had damaged both of the smaller German battleships in their anchorages on the French west coast, leaving just Bismarck and Prince Eugen available for operations. Although a number of light cruisers were also combat ready, the Königsberg and Nuremberg classes did not have either the range or the seaworthiness to be considered useful in prolonged Atlantic operations. Although the Bismarck represented a significantly powerful combat asset, the primary objective was economic warfare, not destruction of military targets, and so although its participation would allow attacks to be mounted on any convoy they came across, the orders given to Admiral Günther Lütjens were very clear, stating The objective of the Bismarck is not to defeat enemies of equal strength, but to tie them down in a delaying action, while preserving her combat capacity as much as possible so as to allow Prince Eugen to get at the merchant ships in the convoy. And, the primary target in this operation is the enemy's merchant shipping. Enemy warships will be engaged only when that objective makes it necessary, and it can be done without excessive risk. As with Graf Spee's expedition at the start of the war, supply ships with both stores and fuel were dispatched ahead of time. Whilst the earlier mission had primarily needed only Altmark, Two larger vessels would need multiple resupply stocks. Lutjens had requested a delay, as Gneisenau was in for long-term repair after an aerial torpedo strike, but Scharnhorst might be ready in a reasonable time, and that delay might allow the completion and training of Tirpitz's crew as well, although the former ship would have to meet them at sea, since it was stuck at the other end of the English Channel. However, these requests were denied, despite a certain degree of tactical soundness. Partially, this was to avoid a long period without major German surface raiding, which would in turn allow the British to build up supplies from convoys that only had to worry about U-boats. But there was also politics. Kriegsmarine High Command knew about the upcoming Operation Barbarossa, and land invasion of Russia, which isn't something that a fleet can play all that much of a major role in. Even shore bombardment would be off the cards once the Baltic coast was secure. With that particular adventure sure to cause a huge increase in demand for funding for the Wehrmacht and the Luftwaffe, scoring a major operational success beforehand would increase the Kriegsmarine's prestige first, and thus allow it to fight to keep most or all of its existing funding. Timing was also important in another aspect. In the higher reaches of the North Atlantic, the effects of the seasons were much more pronounced. Sailing earlier in the year meant considerably more hours of darkness and bad weather that could shield any German ships from visual detection, since at this time not all British ships and very few aircraft had functioning search radar. In contrast, sailing in the later summer months could leave any raiders open to spotting by anyone with a pair of functioning eyeballs for between 18 to 20 hours each day in the northern latitudes. To meet the threat from German capital ships, the British had the battleships of the home fleet at Scapa Flow. Whilst hardly the dozens of battleships of the First World War, this force was usually kept at between three and four capital ships, with vessels rotating in and out on other missions. In May 1941, the home fleet was slightly weaker than average, with the battleships King George V and Prince of Wales, as well as the battlecruiser Hood and the carrier Victorious. On paper, this was a strong force, but Prince of Wales, and to a slightly lesser extent Victorious, were fresh out of the shipyards, and Hood, despite a refit, was literally on its last legs, long passed over for a major refit and reconstruction due to its interwar status as the flagship. It was mostly keeping moving these days, with engines running on patch-ups, rushed repairs, one replaced turbine, and a lot of hope. Further to the south, Gibraltar could send Force H, the relevant ships being the battlecruiser Renown and the aircraft carrier Ark Royal, whilst in the Atlantic on various missions, mostly convoy escort, were the old battleships Revenge and Ramillies, the newer and far more powerful Rodney, 
recently relieved from home fleet duties by the Prince of Wales, and the battle cruiser Repulse. These ships, along with air patrols, cruisers and destroyers, were responsible for an upcoming 11 convoys, including a heavily laden troop convoy. On 5th May 1941, Hitler arrived at Gotenhafen to tour Bismarck and Tirpitz and talk with Lütjens about his plans of the mission. Just under two weeks later, Lütjens reported that Bismarck and Prince Eugen were ready to go, and so orders were issued to start the mission on the 19th of May. Compared to a normal true complement, the Bismarck sailed with over 100 extra men, about 40% of which were the Admiral's staff, and the rest being additional sailors in anticipation of the need to crew captured transport ships during the operation. Early in the morning, she met up with Prince Eugen and a small escort of destroyers and minesweepers, along with Luftwaffe air cover. Once well out of sea, on the 20th, Captain Lindemann informed the ship's crew via loudspeakers of what they were actually about to try and accomplish. Swedish forces quickly spotted the Germans, with both Swedish aircraft and the cruiser Gotland separately encountering the German formation and reporting back to their headquarters. Whilst Kriegsmarine High Command wasn't worried by these incidents, the command officers aboard Bismarck believed secrecy had been lost. And they were right. The Swedish report mysteriously arrived in the mail of the British naval attaché to Sweden, who then informed the Admiralty. The codebreakers at Bletchley Park were also supplying information that an Atlantic raid was about to occur, since they had decrypted reports that Bismarck and Prince Eugen had taken on prize crews and requested additional navigational charts. As a result, a pair of Spitfire recon aircraft were sent to the Norwegian coast to look for the German ships. In return, German aerial recon showed the home fleet still at anchor, thus convincing many that the British were not in fact aware of the operation. That evening, the formation reached the Norwegian coast and only Bismarck, Prince Eugen and the three destroyers continued on. The next day, the 21st, they spotted recon aircraft overhead, but without fighter cover could do little against the high altitude aircraft and instead set about repainting the ship from the more varied Baltic camouflage to a more standard grey that was better suited for Atlantic operations. This obviously had to be done at anchor and so they managed to acquire a pair of Luftwaffe fighters as cover against air attacks. But another recon Spitfire managed to fly right over them at 26,000 feet and got good quality photos. With this information to hand, the home fleet was made ready. Admiral Tovey ordered HMS Hood and HMS Prince of Wales to reinforce the pair of cruisers patrolling the Denmark Strait. The rest of the home fleet, including King George V and Victorious, was placed on high alert and an airstrike was launched by the RAF, although they didn't find anything but fog and clouds. It seems odd that Tovey would send a worn-out ship and a brand new ship first, instead of the more operational Victorious and the fully operational King George V. On the other hand, King George V was the flagship and Tovey likely wanted to remain as close as possible to the latest intelligence. Plus, he needed to gather the rest of the home fleet's cruisers and destroyers. It's somewhat interesting to speculate on what might have occurred had King George V and Victorious been sent out instead, or alongside Hood and Prince of Wales. But that isn't what happened, so we'll press on with the actual history. Knowing that his main battery was still being worked on and might well break down, Captain Leach of the Prince of Wales ensured that civilian experts still trying to fix the issues remained aboard, something that would prove vital later on as events transpired. In Norway, Prince Eugen topped up her fuel stocks, but Bismarck did not, despite now being 1200 tons short on a full load of fuel, again as events would occur, this would prove to be a significant decision. By early morning on the 22nd, the ships were back at sea with the destroyers turning for home, whilst the two larger ships headed north. At lunchtime, they began to turn west for a run into the Denmark Strait. Beyond it lay the Atlantic and many rich and tasty convoys. In the early morning hours of the 23rd, Bismarck and Prince Eugen increased speed to 27 knots, now technically breaking the speed limits for urban areas. To make a fast passage into the open ocean, activating radar and at the same time listening for the sweep of British surface search radar. Mist and fog rolled in and whilst visibility reduced to less than 4 kilometers, they began to see ice floating around them. Not wishing to go down in history as an especially heavily armed version of the Titanic, speed was reduced to 24 knots 
and the ships began to maneuver to avoid the worst of the ice. Around dinner time, they noticed HMS Suffolk, a county class heavy cruiser, had snuck up to just under 14,000 yards away as it appeared on both radar and hydrophone systems. Prince Eugen signaled that it has also intercepted radio traffic. Suffolk was reporting their position. Suffolk realised the odds were against her and quickly fell back out of gun range and began to shadow her targets. Joined a few hours later by her sister ship, HMS Norfolk, which began to drift closer. Too close, in fact, as Bismarck opened fire, and with a number of salvos dousing the Norfolk with water and shell splinters, the ship vanished into a fog bank after laying smoke, reporting the engagement back to the Admiralty. Another small but vital piece of the puzzle slotted into place, as Norfolk reported Bismarck was leading the Prince Eugen. This was true, but after the gunfire died down, it was discovered that the concussion of Bismarck's own guns had knocked out its main forward radar set. As a result, Prince Eugen was ordered to take the lead with its still-functioning radar. As the night drew on, Suffolk detected the German formation turning back on itself and heading towards them. Without radar, the Germans would have emerged from a rain school at point-blank range, but thanks to their radar, Suffolk and Norfolk were able to take the appropriate evasive action in time to avoid being shelled again, instead sitting annoyingly off the German sterns and radioing their location, course and speed to anyone who would listen. Aware of the weaknesses in Hood's armour protection, Admiral Tovey thought about ordering Prince of Wales to sail ahead of Hood, the idea being that the better protected Prince of Wales could draw the German fire, especially from Bismarck, which they still believed was in the lead. But Tovey concluded that micromanaging another ranking flag officer remotely from Scapa Flow was not justified, and so he left Holland to make his own tactical decision. Vice Admiral Holland's plan aboard Hood was actually fairly well thought out. Hood and Prince of Wales would target Bismarck, whilst Suffolk and Norfolk engaged Prince Eugen, again on the assumption that Bismarck was the lead ship. Whilst he informed Prince of Wales of the plan, he didn't tell Suffolk and Norfolk for fear of the signals being intercepted and thus ruining the surprise. So far north, the sun didn't set until very late, and he was hoping to approach from the darkness with the German ships silhouetted against the setting sun, the same situation Admiral Spee had forced on Admiral Craddock at the start of the First World War, only in reverse. A surprise attack like this would allow the British warships to close in before opening fire, negating some of the fears over Hood's armour, and allowing for what would hopefully be a devastating opening broadside. Unfortunately, Suffolk temporarily lost contact with the German fleet, and without accurate speed and course data, the Hood and Prince of Wales were forced to turn and detach their destroyers to start a search pattern. Nevertheless, Vice Admiral Holland had guessed right, and the two forces were on a collision course. Only the reduced visibility prevented the two sides from spotting each other in the gathering gloom, with the German ships altering course early in the morning as a result of spotting ice, which took them back out of range. Just before 0300, Suffolk regained contact with Bismarck, with Holland rapidly working out that his forces were now about 35 miles away, their new positions meaning that the closing angle was much, much wider, and so the rate of closure would be slower. Regardless, the ships increased speed to 28 knots and made for their targets. As the weather cleared in the morning on the 24th May, the German hydrophone operators heard new sounds, powerful turbine engines about 20 nautical miles away and closing fast from the southeast. A few minutes later, smoke was spotted on the horizon, and through the early morning haze came the onrushing forms of HMS Hood and HMS Prince of Wales under the overall command of Vice Admiral Holland. Aboard the Bismarck, Admiral Lütjens ordered the crew to battle stations and the four main battery turrets began to swing to port. The Battle of the Denmark Strait was about to begin. <laughs> Zero five thirty five. Twenty fourth of May, nineteen forty one. Lookouts aboard HMS Prince of Wales spot the German ships at fifteen nautical miles distance. Holland has three options join Norfolk and Suffolk in following Bismarck, 
hold position until Tubby arrives with King George V victorious and both his own escorts and the destroyers that Hood and Prince of Wales had detached earlier, or commit to an immediate attack. After a couple of minutes evaluating options, he decides the seas are too rough for destroyers to have any real role, and Norfolk and Suffolk are too far away to catch up in time, and so he orders his ships to begin closing for action. 0552. At about 26,500 yards, Hood opens fire. Still operating on previous intelligence, Holland's flagship begins action against the leading vessel, believing that it is Bismarck. In fact, it is Prince Eugen. HMS Prince of Wales is already engaging Bismarck, and after several minutes, Holland will realise his mistake and realign his fire towards Bismarck as well. But vital minutes and salvos are already being lost, and the fire control solution will need to be recalculated once the error is realised. Knowing that Hood's deck armour is insufficient for a long-range engagement, he is determined to close that range, but with the unfavourable angle due to his late arrival, the angle of closing means that Hood's rear two turrets and Prince of Wales' rear quad turret cannot be brought to bear as the ships close, leaving the British with only a two-gun advantage in battleship-grade weapons. That advantage halves as one of the 14-inch guns ceases to work after the first salvo. Suffolk and Norfolk are racing to catch up, but the high speed of the capital ships leave them out of range and closing at less than walking pace. The situation is further complicated by the Germans having the weather gauge. Although more often a term heard in the Age of Sail, the wind in this case is high enough that it means that the rangefinders on the British ship's turrets are being drenched with spray, and the smaller ones mounted higher on the ships needed to be used instead. 0553, 24th May 1941. The Bismarck increases speed to 30 knots, closing on the Prince Eugen in front, currently going at 27 knots. The main artillery is ready to open fire, and the first artillery officer, Lieutenant Commander, in German Korvettenkapitän, Adalbert Schneider, asks permission to do so, but no answer comes back. Hood's second salvo falls close to Prince Eugen, whilst Prince of Wales' second salvo lands close to Bismarck. Slightly long and with only five shells instead of six because the malfunction in the forward quadruple turret. Lieutenant Burkhardt von Mühlenheim Rechberg, third, artillery officer and in charge of Bismarck's aft rangefinder receives an order from Admiral Lutyens to keep an eye on the two British heavy cruisers, which are in visual range, but out of accurate gunnery range. 0554. Hood and Prince of Wales change course, turning 20 degrees to port to allow the Prince of Wales aft quadruple turret to bear along with Hood's two rear twin 15-inch gun turrets. As this order is given and the ships begin to turn, Hood fires her third salvo on Prince Eugen and Prince of Wales fires her third salvo at Bismarck, both missing but with the shells tracking in closer every time. 0555. On the Bismarck, Schneider asks for permission to fire for a second time. As he is speaking, another salvo from Prince of Wales lands, this time all around the ship, showering it with water and splinters. The Admiral has still not authorized firing, but Kapitän Lutyens takes matters into his own hands. Ich lass mir doch nicht mein Schiff unter meinem Arsch wegschießen. Feuer öffnen. Or in English, I will not let them to shoot my ship out from under my ass. Open fire. Prince Eugen soon sees a signal flag flying to target the first ship in the British line, the Hood, and Kapitän Brinkmann informs his own gunnery officer of their target. Both ships open up fire almost at the same time with the forward turrets firing a few seconds before the rear turrets, allowing the Germans to make two sets of observations per salvo. Aboard Prince Eugen, which has been carefully calculating the range repeatedly for the past few minutes as Hood's shells march closer and closer, the first four shells are long, the second set straddle the target but score no hits. All of Bismarck's first salvo are short and too far ahead. Still at 0555, Hood fires a fourth salvo at Prince Eugen, again no hits, whilst Prince of Wales fires her fifth salvo at Bismarck, yet another gun seizing up in the forward quadruple turret, 
immediately after, leaving only four guns available from the forward turrets for the sixth salvo, but this salvo is the first on either side to score a hit, one shell hitting Bismarck on the bow, punching clean through the ship before detonating in the sea. Although no explosive damage had been caused, fuel lines were severed and the hit is low enough that as oil poured out, water poured in, eventually adding up to over 2,000 tonnes of unwelcome Atlantic inside the hull. 0556 Bismarck continues firing at the hood, the second salvo is long and behind the hood, landing between the two British ships some distance behind their line. However, Prince Eugen's second salvo is more on target, the first group of four shells are short, but the second set are on target and a single hit lands between the second funnel and main mast. It seems this hit set fire to either ready use 4 inch anti-aircraft ammunition, some anti-aircraft rocket launchers or possibly both. Prince Eugen fires a third salvo at hood but misses. Ted Briggs, up on the compass platform of Hood, reported, I was flung off my feet. My ears were ringing, as if I had been in the striking chamber of Big Ben. I picked myself up, thinking I had made a complete fool of myself, but everyone else on the compass platform was also scrambling to his feet. Commander Tiny Gregson walked out almost sedately onto the starboard wing of the platform to find out what had happened. When he returned, he informed us that she has hit us on the boat deck and there is a fire in the ready-use lockers. Closer to the ammunition fire, Petty Officer Edward Bishop came aft and ordered three of Hood's crewmen to help put it out. To which they replied, well, when it stops exploding, we will. Hood fires salvos 5 and 6 at Prince Eugen, still only using her forward turrets, but again misses. Prince of Wales fires salvos 7 and 8 at Bismarck, but both sets of shells go over the target. Despite the 20 degree turn to port ordered a couple of minutes earlier, the two British ships were still firing only with the forward turrets. Norfolk and Suffolk are closing in, but are still out of range. 0557. Both German ships continue to concentrate on the hood. Prince Eugen fires salvo 4 and 5, whilst Bismarck fires salvo 3. One shell from each ship hits hood. The shell from Bismarck knocks out the fire control tower on Hood, killing almost everyone there. The shell from Prince Eugen hits the forward superstructure, bursting in a room where a couple of hundred sailors, primarily from the anti-aircraft battery crews, are sheltering, killing many of them and starting another fire. The distance has closed quickly and the three 5.9 inch turrets on Bismarck's port side fire on the Prince of Wales whilst the four twin 5.25 inch turrets on the starboard side of Prince of Wales fire on Bismarck. The Hood fires Salvo 7, still with only the four forward 15 inch guns against Prince Eugen, while Prince of Wales fires Salvo 9 at Bismarck using her rear turret as well as the remaining forward guns. This Salvo scores another hit on the German battleship under the waterline, exploding against the torpedo bulkhead and causing another fuel leak. 0558. Admiral Lütjens decides that with hits being scored repeatedly on his ship, it is not wise to leave the Prince of Wales firing against Bismarck unopposed, and orders Prince Eugen, Wechsel auf linken Gegner, or change to left enemy. Bismarck fires Salvo 4 at Hurt falling short but on the correct bearing, whilst Prince Eugen fires Salvo 6, a last at Hurt, followed by Salvo 7 at the Prince of Wales. Prince of Wales fires salvos 10 and 11 at Bismarck, both land short, and after this another gun goes offline, this one's in the rear turret, leaving the ship with seven operational guns. A Sunderland flying boat appears and notices two fires aboard Hood, watching as Hood's salvo 8, still only with the forward guns, miss Prince Eugen yet again. 0559 Prince Eugen fires two more salvos, 8 and 9, at Prince of Wales, but does not hit the target. Prince of Wales fires salvo 12 and salvo 13, scoring a third hit on Bismarck. This one lands in the middle of the ship under the mainmast, smashing the front of one of the ship's boats and damaging the catapult system used to launch the reconnaissance aircraft, but without any substantial resistance to its passage, the shell passes through and hits the sea beyond the ship, leaving a neat hole in the starboard hull. Hood fires salvo 10, 
reportedly the first using all eight guns at Prince Eugen, but still fails to hit her. Another signal is made for a further 20 degree turn, whilst Norfolk and Suffolk continue to close, with Norfolk almost in range of the Bismarck. With Vice Admiral Holland ordering the raging ammunition fire on Hood's main deck to be left to burn out, Ted Briggs reports, Chief Yeoman Khan passed the word onto the flag deck, where surprisingly someone still seemed to be capable of obeying orders. Two blue, flag two a blue pendant, went up the yard arm. I remember musing, well, not everyone on the flag deck is dead then. Bismarck fires several five in two groups. The first four shells fired by turrets Anton and Bruno are short, but the second set from Caesar and Dora straddle the hood amidships. The time is 0600 hours on the 24th of May 1941. Captain Leach, aboard Prince of Wales, is only 750 metres away from Hood and reports, I happened to be looking at the Hood at the moment when a salvo arrived, and it appeared to be across the ship somewhere about the mainmast. In that salvo there were, I think, two shots short and one over, but it may have been the other way around. But I formed the impression at the time that something had arrived on board the Hood in a position just before the mainmast and slightly to starboard. It was not a very definite impression that I had, but it was sufficiently definite to make me look at the hood for a further period. I in fact wondered what the result was going to be, and between one and two seconds after, I formed that impression, an explosion took place in the hood, which appeared to me to come from very much the same position in the ship. There was a very fierce upward rush of flame in the shape of a funnel, a rather a thin funnel, and almost instantaneously the ship was enveloped in smoke from one end to the other. Able seaman Ted Briggs reports, As the hood turned, X turret roared in approval, but its Y twin stayed silent, and then a blinding flash swept around the outside of the compass platform. Again I found myself being lifted off my feet and dumped headfirst on the deck. This time, when I got up with the others, the scene was different. Everything was cold and unreal. The ship, which had been a haven for me for the last two years, was suddenly hostile. Bob Tilburn, further down in the ship, reported, The next shell came aft, and the ship shook like mad. I was next to the gun shield, so I was protected from the blast, but one of my mates was killed, and the other had his side cut open by a splinter. It opened him up like a butcher, and all his innards were coming out. Back on the bridge, as Ted Briggs and the rest of the bridge crew hauled themselves to their feet, he continued to report, After the initial jarring, she listed slowly, almost hesitatingly, to starboard. She stopped after about ten degrees, when I heard the helmsman's voice shouting up the voice pipe to the officer of the watch, Steering's gone, sir. The reply of, Very good, showed no signs of animation or agitation. Immediately, one of the officers ordered, Change over to emergency steering. Although the hood had angled to starboard, there was still no concern on the compass platform. Holland was back in his chair. He looked aft towards Prince of Wales, and then retrained his binoculars on the Bismarck. Slowly, the hood righted herself. Thank heaven for that, I murmured to myself, only to be terrorised by her sudden, horrifying cant to port. On and on she rolled, until she reached an angle of 45 degrees. The explosion breaks the ship in two, and it goes down so quickly that the suction takes down everyone who has managed to make it into the water, with the exception of Briggs, Tilburn, and midshipman William Dundas, who are all dragged under, but an ex expanding gas bubble, possibly caused by the collapse of an internal compartment or the explosion of one of the boilers, propels all three of them back to the surface. Without this lucky phenomenon, Hood almost certainly would have been lost with all hands. As it is, only these three men will survive. 1,415 of their shipmates will go down with the Hood. The explosion in question was most likely a very fast burn of the main gun charges, and was almost silent with a very tall column of fire, consistent with some of the losses of battlecruisers at Jutland. First, the fire was very clear, indicating a high heat, then yellow, then red, then becoming a grey mushroom of dark and dense smoke. 
debris cascaded down all around as the explosion broke the ship into two separate pieces around the mainmast area. Large quantities of fuel oil poured out from ruptured tanks and started burning on the sea, and as Hood went over to port, this accelerated into a final plunge from which she would never return. The broken hull caused the stern section to sink first, going down rapidly, shortly followed by the bow, which began to swing upwards until it was at about a 45 degree angle before beginning a final plunge beneath the waves. Somehow, as the last of the battlecruiser began to accelerate downwards, witnesses on both sides report the forward turrets firing one last defiant salvo before slipping beneath the Atlantic. Ted Briggs recounts, This was it, I realised, but I wasn't going to give in easily. I knew that the deck head of the compass platform was above me and I must try to swim away from it. I managed to avoid being knocked out by the steel stanchions, but I was not making any progress. The suction was dragging me down. The pressure on my ears was increasing each second, and panic returned in its worst intensity. I was going to die. I struggled madly to try and heave myself up to the surface, but I got nowhere. Although it seemed an eternity, I was underwater for barely a minute. My lungs were bursting. I knew that I just had to breathe. I opened my lips and gulped in a mouthful of water. My tongue was forced to the back of my throat. I was not going to reach the surface. I was going to die. As I weakened, my resolve left me. What was the use of struggling? Panic subsided. I had heard it was nice to drown. I stopped trying to swim upwards. The water was a peaceful cradle. I was being rocked off to sleep. There was nothing I could do about it. So good night, Mum. Now I lay me, me down. I was ready to meet God. My blissful acceptance of death ended in a sudden surge beneath me, which shot me to the surface like a decanted cork in a champagne bottle. I wasn't going to die. I trod water as I panted in great gulps of air. I was alive. Tilburn had a similar experience, stating, I had my sea boots on and a very tight belt. I paddled around in the water and took my knife and cut my belt so I could breathe properly. Then I looked around and saw the ship was rolling over on top of me. It wasn't a shadow, it was a big mast coming down on top of me. It caught me across the back of the legs and the radio aerial wrapped around the back of my legs and started pulling me down. I still had my knife in my hands, so I cut my sea boots off and shot to the surface. I looked up to see the hood with her bows in the air. Then she slid under. Up above, the Sunderland was still flying over the action and at this point the German ships open up with an intense anti-aircraft barrage. Aboard the Bismarck, reactions on the apocalyptic detonation on the horizons were mixed. Wilhelm Wieck, commander of one of the ship's starboard 20mm forward batteries, noted that none who witnessed the terrible scene could remain indifferent. Some were elated over the victory. However, he also noted that some of the sailors nearby had tears in their eyes as the British ship sank. They had empathy for the seamen who were losing their lives in the brief hellstorm the German guns had unleashed. Ahead, Prince Eugen fires salvos 10 and 11 at Prince of Wales, obtaining no hits. Prince of Wales fired on the Bismarck with her 14th through 16th salvos during this period, with all shells falling short of the target. Everything happened so fast that Bismarck continued firing at Hood even as it went down, so Salvo 6 landed well ahead of the rapidly vanishing wreck. 0601. The last remnants of Hood are almost gone as Prince of Wales now finds itself on a collision course with the wreck. The battleship makes an emergency starboard turn, pointing its bow toward the Germans and masking the rear turret again, although one of the disabled forward guns has started working again. On board the Prince Eugen, Captain Brinkmann sees the Prince of Wales closing and orders the torpedoes readied for launch as the remaining target is almost in range. Bismarck now switches target to the Prince of Wales and since it was following Hood's course closely, the corrections to the fire control solution needed are minimal. Salvos 7 from Bismarck and Salvos 12 and 13 from Prince Eugen are fired to try and find the exact range. The Sunderland withdraws at this point because of the heavy anti-aircraft fire from both German ships. Prince of Wales is now under fire from the main and secondary batteries of both German vessels. 
Her own salvos 17 and 18 land short, not helped by the violent turns she is having to make to avoid what is left of Hood. 0602. Bismarck fires salvo 8 and hits Prince of Wales on the bridge. It does not explode, but its passage kills almost everyone there, although not the captain. This causes the ship to temporarily cease fire as the ship turns to port to disengage. The Prince Eugen fires salvo 14 but misses. Just a few minutes too late, Norfolk opens fire on Bismarck with three 8 inch salvos from 21,800 yards that all fall short. Further behind, Suffolk is still out of range. 0603. Oil fires on the surface are all that's left of Hood as Prince of Wales turns 160 degrees to port and covers herself with a smoke screen as it attempts to disengage. Before this can be completed, Bismarck fires Salvo 9 and scores two hits. One shell hit the water well short of the ship, but the fuse fails to detonate and the shell punches through under the belt and comes to rest deep inside the ship. The other shell hits the starboard 5.25 inch fire control station, putting it out of action. Prince Eugen fires Salvo 16 and 17, finally scoring a hit under the waterline on the stern. The range is so close that even the port side heavy anti-aircraft guns join in. Suddenly, an alarm signal is received on Bismarck from Prince Eugen. An incoming torpedo has been detected on hydrophones and is confirmed when Kapitän Brinkmann steps out onto the bridge wing and sees the tracks. The only Sunderland wasn't carrying torpedoes, nor was Prince of Wales. The only ship that could have been responsible therefore was the Hood, which presumably must have fired them either as it was sinking or almost immediately before. The Bismarck immediately turns hard to starboard to evade a death blow from the grave, whilst Prince Eugen likewise takes evasive actions. Hood may thus inadvertently have saved Prince of Wales from sharing its fate, as this evasive action has given the ship some breathing room to fully establish the smoke screen as it withdraws, and fires its 19th salvo from the rear turret, falling well short as both firing ship and target are now moving rapidly away from each other. Seeing this, Norfolk ceases fire and Suffolk hangs back. 0604. The Bismarck fired her next salvo on land at one last hit on Prince of Wales, destroying the port side crane and some boats, making a hole in the second funnel and damaging the walrus seaplane left on deck. After having made her evasive turn, Prince Eugen fires salvo 18, scoring two hits, one of the stern below the waterline and the other near the fourth. 5.25 inch turret, but this shell does not explode. Prince of Wales fires salvo 20 from the rear turret, but again falls short as Norfolk and Suffolk pick up their shadowing stations. 0605. Distances are increasing and Bismarck salvo 11 and Prince Eugen's salvo 19 score no hit, with fire becoming less accurate and their own turns plus Prince of Wales' evasive actions ruin the fire control solutions. Prince of Wales fires her last salvo, number 21, from the sole remaining functioning gun in the rear turret, landing close to Bismarck's bow. 06, 06. Over the next few minutes, Bismarck fires salvo 12 and 13 and Prince Eugen fires salvo 20 to 23 for no results as the Prince of Wales ship's courses cross several times and soon after Admiral Lutyens orders both ships to cease fire. Captain Lindemann doesn't agree and wants to chase the Prince of Wales to finish her off. But Admiral Lutyens knows his orders prohibiting any engagement by his units unless it was necessary to sink merchant ship convoys. Following the Prince of Wales back towards the UK could have further exposed his ships and he was concerned that the Royal Navy was probably converging on the battle area. And with that, the Battle of the Denmark Strait is over. The entire engagement, from the first shell fired to the last shell that lands, has taken about a quarter of an hour. Aboard Prince of Wales, crew and civilian technicians work feverishly, eventually bringing all but one gun back online before lunchtime. Shortly after the withdrawal is complete, Suffolk fires six salvos in the direction of Bismarck, having mistaken a radar contact with an aircraft for Bismarck herself. She was actually well out of range. 
With the loss of Hood and Vice Admiral Holland, local command fell to Rear Admiral Wake Walker aboard Norfolk. Technically, once Prince of Wales' main battery was operational, he would still have the odds in his favour if he closed in with Norfolk and Suffolk in support of the battleship. But he also knew that many other heavy units were available, and there was no guarantee that Prince of Wales' guns wouldn't start to fail again and so he chose to shadow the Germans until at least King George V and Victorious could arrive. The first good sign was that just before 0800, Suffolk reported that Bismarck had reduced speed and appeared to be damaged. The flooding caused by Prince of Wales was now causing the tip of the starboard propeller to rise out of the water. Lindemann ordered counter-flooding aft to restore the ship's trim before sending divers into the forecastle to connect the forward fuel tanks with their 1,000 tons of fuel to the rest of the ship via emergency fuel lines. However, both attempts failed and Lindemann asks for permission to slow Bismarck to weld patches from the inside to the holes in the forward hull. Lutyens initially refuses but eventually had to agree to slow the ship to 22 knots to allow for some damage control efforts in number 2 boiler room and the auxiliary boiler room to stop the increasing flooding. But this too failed and boiler room number 2 had to be shut down, reducing top speed to 28 knots. Noticing the leaking fuel oil, Lütjens ordered Prince Eugen to drop back and see how much of a trail she was leaving astern. It was bad news. The oil slick was broad enough to cover both sides of the ship's wake, was all colors of the rainbow and gave off a strong smell all of which helped disclose Bismarck's location. Without access to the forward fuel tanks and accounting for the fuel burn since leaving Germany, they had about 3000 tons of usable fuel left, not enough for effective raiding, and now they had a British squadron following their every move. Lutyens concluded that he needed to abort the mission and head to a dockyard for repairs. Confusion related to identifying ships had not been limited to the British side. As the Bismarck sailed away from the battle area, Lutyens reported battle cruiser, probably Hood, sunk. Another battleship, King George V or Renown, turned away damaged. Two heavy cruisers maintained contact. Shortly afterwards, he sent the ship damage report and his change plan of actions back to the headquarters. Since Prince Eugen had not sustained damage in the battle, it was to be detached to continue the commerce raiding mission whilst Bismarck made for port. The problem the Germans faced was which port to head for. Norwegian ports were geographically the closest, but that would mean fighting back past Suffolk, Norfolk and Prince of Wales, with the battleship tailing the other two cruisers. Plus, whatever other elements of the home fleet and RAF might be beyond them, but between Bismarck and Norway. Lütjens was not in a position where he felt he could trust the intel reports coming in from Germany, since, until the British had come over the horizon that morning, his best information said that Hood was somewhere down in Africa, and there had been nothing on any King George V-class battleship in UK waters at all. Both sets of information had obviously been blatantly wrong. Still, Captain Lindemann thought Bergen may still be the best bet, but Lutyens chose the French port of Saint-Nazaire, although further away the seas were more open in that direction, allowing more room to outmaneuver pursuers, U-boats could be deployed relatively quickly and it would leave the battleship in the same vicinity as the two Scharnhorst class, which would make a powerful battle group once Bismarck was repaired, even more so if Prince Eugen survived her commerce raiding. The French port was also far better equipped with dry docks and other heavy naval infrastructure that would be useful for making repairs to such a large ship especially if the damage they'd taken got worse or if they suffered additional damage in battle on the way there. In Germany, the news was received with a mixture of confusion and elation. The latter is easy to understand, with Josef Goebbels' propaganda ministry publishing the reports of the destruction of the hood enthusiastically. Whilst in German high command, Lütjens' relatively brief signal had left them wondering exactly what his plans were. Some thought he was heading straight for France, Others thought he might refuel first from a tanker, still others that he might try to engage either warships or merchant ships along the way. In the background, a few intelligence analysts were probably quietly given some one-way tickets to join the other soldiers preparing for Operation Barbarossa. Naval High Command was split over whether to give Lutyens explicit orders or not. 
but eventually a decision was taken that the Admiral was probably the best one to take decisions as he would know the situation much better than anyone at home. In the UK, the British public was shocked by the loss of the hood. Whilst the ship itself going down was unwelcome, it could be expected in a battle with a brand new battleship of about the same size. But this was compounded with the speed of the destruction. Hood going down after a slugging match with Bismarck was one thing, simply exploding like the worst horrors of Jutland with little to show for it was something else entirely. However, amongst the Royal Navy, the shock effect passed quite quickly, and all of a sudden Bismarck found itself in a similar situation to someone who's wandered into an old pub, had a few drinks, and just won a fistfight with one of the regular patrons. Then looked around to find dead silence and practically everyone else in the building, from the old gentleman with the hat and cane to a pack of youngsters over at the main table, all slowly turning to stare in their direction and start reaching for the nearest object that wasn't nailed to the ground. The Royal Navy ordered all warships in the area to join the pursuit of Bismarck and Prince Eugen. Tuvi's remaining ships of the home fleet were on an intercept course, along with the three ships that were already following Bismarck. The Admiralty further ordered the light cruisers Manchester, Birmingham and Arethusa to patrol the Denmark Strait in the event that Lutjens attempted to retrace his route. The battleship Rodney was mid-Atlantic, escorting RMS Britannic, and was headed to Boston Navy Yard for a refit, but quickly turned round and ramped its old engines to well beyond the red line, plunging through the Atlantic swells at well over its original design speed, despite the boilers already being almost shot and now practically coming apart at the seams. Two old Revenge-class battleships, similarly employed on convoy escort, also entered the fray, HMS Revenge steaming out from Halifax in Canada, whilst HMS Ramillies left convoy HX-127. The battlecruiser HMS Repulse was also escorting convoys and likewise joined the search. From Gibraltar came the battlecruiser HMS Renown, the aircraft carrier Ark Royal, and the rest of Force H, including the cruiser HMS Sheffield. Off the African coast, another battleship on convoy escort, HMS Nelson, was ordered to make best speed to Gibraltar to take on fuel and then join the effort. In total, at least 60 warships, including at least half of the Royal Navy's active capital ships, were all heading for Bismarck's last reported location. Blissfully unaware of the hornet's nest that had been stirred, Lütjens was trying to get Prince Eugen to break off without alerting his pursuers. Although the weather had gotten worse, the traditional method of sailing into a rain squall wasn't so effective when your enemy had radar and the first attempt failed. About an hour and a half later, a second attempt was made, this time with the slightly more compelling distraction of Bismarck turning back and running straight at the British ships. Suffolk was forced to evade, whilst Prince of Wales and Bismarck changed about a dozen salvos without any hits scored on either side. Once the German battleship had resumed course, the Prince Eugen was nowhere to be found, just as planned. The British soon found themselves facing another problem. Although the hits by Prince of Wales had caused Bismarck to lose speed, it could still make something in the region of 27 to 28 knots, which meant that the only remaining capital ships capable of catching it were HMS Renown and Repulse, and no one was particularly keen to send them in unsupported after the loss of HMS Hood. Unless some way could be found of slowing down the German ship, it would reach Luftwaffe air cover, and then safe port, before any substantial force could be brought to bear. Therefore, the following day, Tuvi detached HMS Victorious from King George V in order to conduct a torpedo bomber strike. With the carrier almost as new as Prince of Wales, and still also in the process of working up, all she could muster on board were six Fulmar fighters and nine swordfish, who then nearly attacked HMS Norfolk and a random US Coast Guard cutter that, for some bizarre reason, was in the mid-Atlantic. This alerted Bismarck to the incoming air assault. Rear Admiral Curtis, commanding 2nd Cruiser Squadron, signalled Victorious, Please convey my sincerest good wishes to all who are flying tonight. They have a wonderful chance to avenge Hood and gain a success which will be invaluable to our cause. Good luck. As the British aircraft flew in, the Bismarck's anti-aircraft battery opened up. 
whilst the main and secondary batteries were ordered to fire high explosive shells into the sea ahead of the swordfish to create huge plumes of water, with the idea that these would either break up the attack, force torpedoes off course, or, if they were very lucky, destroy an aircraft that happened to fly into one of the plumes. In the event, none of the swordfish were shot down, and they all managed to successfully drop their torpedoes. Eight of the nine either missed or were evaded, with the last hitting amidships, where the armoured belt and torpedo defences were thickest. The damage caused by the torpedo hit itself was minimal, one dead and five injured from the shockwave throwing them into the steel bulkheads, with some minor damage to electrical equipment. Ironically, the other eight torpedoes could have been said to have caused more damage than the one that actually hit, as in the efforts made to evade them, the constant and rapid changes in speed and course loosened the temporary matting that was plugging the forward shell hole, which allowed more water in and forced the shutdown of the port number two boiler room. Combined with additional water ingress, this forced the ship to slow down to 16 knots for some time until the matting could be repaired, which allowed speed to increase again with the ship proceeding at 20 knots to conserve the limited fuel reserves in order to guarantee that they would actually make the French coast. Their work was briefly interrupted by another exchange of fire between Bismarck and Prince of Wales, again with no hits, and once the flooding was contained, the ship was slowed again down to 12 knots to allow for a menu of fuel lines to be rigged, salvaging some of the fuel stuck in the forward tanks, which gave the ship more reserve fuel for high-speed engagements, and also lightened the bow by a few hundred tons, further helping the ship's profile and speed. With the main body of the chase now heading south across the seas used by various convoys, there was a real risk of stray U-boats and the British ships began to zigzag just in case. However, with the ships trailing to port at the start, this means the port side aspect of the zigzag takes them the furthest away from Bismarck, critically just out of radar range. In the early morning hours, Lutyen waits for his moment, then breaks west to starboard, keeping up the turn to eventually end up circling around, so that Bismarck is now behind the British. Finding Bismarck gone, and assuming that it had simply sailed west, Suffolk headed out in that direction, but of course, finds nothing. As dawn breaks, Norfolk and Prince of Wales join the search, but of course they're looking entirely the wrong way, as Bismarck now quietly resumes its course for France. This is very bad news for the Royal Navy. Many of the ships called in were already on other duties and so have limited fuel stocks remaining, enough to head for a rendezvous, but not enough to add hours or days of high-speed searching to their tasks. Now, a comedy of errors begins. British ships are heading south and west, away from him, but Lucien seems to be unaware that he has finally shaken off pursuit and sends a series of long radio messages to Naval Group West HQ in Paris, revealing his position for all to see. Then the errors are compounded further as the co-coordinates are plotted wrongly on King George V, making it look like Bismarck has doubled back towards the Denmark Strait, causing the home fleet to turn in that direction. After almost half a day, someone realizes the mistake, but by now Bismarck has of course moved positions, so again its location is unknown, and the ship now has a substantial lead over ships that were previously almost caught up. Finally, something starts to go right for the British when their signals decryption, along with French resistance reports, indicate that the Luftwaffe is relocating units to provide air support for Bismarck and these reports indicating that the ship is now heading for the closer but more vulnerable port of Brest. In response, a squadron of Catalina flying boats based in Northern Ireland head south to cover the sea lanes. Just before 10.30 hours on the 26th of May, a Catalina flown by a US Navy pilot on loan spots the first oil, and then the ship itself. That's the good news. The bad news is that at current course and speed, Bismarck will reach air cover long before any of the heavy surface units can catch it. Wilhelm Wieck takes the opportunity to talk with some of the forward gunnery crew, who mention that during the main battery firing over the past few days, there are sometimes interruptions with the communication and data they're receiving from the ship's fire control centres that seem to coincide with the ship firing salvos. Unknown to the chatting crewmen, 
it's an artifact of certain data communications cables that are not protected by heavy armour, then being subject to the shock of the 15-inch gun blasts, much like the knocked-out forward radar set was. Victorious, Prince of Wales, Suffolk and Repulse are forced to break off due to low fuel. Nelson, Revenge and Ramillies are now far too far away. This leaves King George V, Rodney, Renown and Ark Royal as the only major vessels left in the game, with Ark Royal being the only ship actually capable of inflicting damage in time. Following the Catalina's reports, Ark Royal's own patrolling swordfish confirmed the Germans' location, not more than 60 miles away from the carrier, and return for an immediate strike, whilst Admiral Somerville, commanding Force H, also orders HMS Sheffield to move forward to shadow the battleship. With a remarkably quick turnaround time, the swordfish head back out, although the weather is not exactly pleasant for carrier operations, one pilot noting, The wind was gusting over the deck at up to 50 knots, even though the ship had reduced speed to moderate the deck movement. The after end of the flight deck was pitching something like 50 feet up and down, and the waves were so high that even the 60 foot height from waterline to flight deck of Ark Royal was still sometimes taking it green over her bows. Renown's weather decks were continuously awash, and we couldn't see Sheffield through all the spume and spray. The aircraft, as their throttles were opened, instead of charging forward on a level deck, were at one moment climbing a slippery slope, the next plunging downhill towards the huge seas ahead and beyond. Some of them seemed to touch the wave tops as they fell off the bows, others were nose up as they came unstuck, but thanks to the skill of our pilots, they all flew away safely. However, having not been warned of Sheffield's new orders, they dive in to attack the first big ship they spot, which is of course the Sheffield. This turns out not to be entirely a tragedy. Sheffield survives thanks to the new magnetic torpedo detonators malfunctioning hopelessly, and at the same time it points out that the weapons are incredibly faulty. An attack on Bismarck by the squadron would have actually been worse than useless, as it would have taken the pilots too long to get there and then come back to rearm for a follow-up strike with working weapons before it became too dark. Sheffield restrains her anti-aircraft gunners, with the captain and other members of the crew settling for hurling abuse and shaking fists at the aviators. Beating a hasty retreat and now working against the clock as daylight begins to fade, Ark Royal rushes to rearm its aircraft with torpedoes that use the conventional contact detonators, and at 19.10 hours, the last chance to stop the Bismarck takes to the skies. This time, they are aware of the Sheffield, as Charles Friend, an observer in one of the Swordfish, observes. Making all of 50 knots with our full loads, we rumbled off in the right direction. We had sighted Sheffield below us before the subplot flight following Tim Coode's lead climbed into the low cloud. When we popped out through the top, there was not another aircraft in sight. Tony said, Where, I ask, is the Bismarck? Don't know, I replied, but I know where Sheffield is and gave him a course to steer. Sure enough, we reached the shadowing cruiser as we came down through the cloud. We flew low past her and I made Where is Target by Alderslamp. Enemy bears 185 distant 10 miles, came the helpful reply. Thus, using their erstwhile target as a marker point, and with a cruiser helpfully indicating Bismarck this way, to anyone who was interested, the aircraft headed off in the right direction. Sheffield almost pays the price for this as she strays too close and Bismarck opens fire on the cruiser, straddling the ship before the swordfish swooping down give the crew somewhat more pressing concerns. Fifteen swordfish make their attacks in the teeth of German anti-aircraft fire, despite their aircraft being riddled with fragments and almost every one of the crew being injured in some way, the remarkably resilient swordfish plough on. Terry Goddard is flying another of the swordfish. I had estimated it would be nine minutes to Bismarck, and just before nine minutes, all around us is thundering noise. The whole aircraft shook as if there were a number of express trains roaring by us. We figured Bismarck had opened fire on us. In actual fact, she had opened fire on Sheffield, but we had found her, so down we went. Ice was peeling off the wings and I couldn't see a bloody thing. 
The altimeter is spinning, spinning and spinning, and we break into the clear at about 600 feet, and there's Bismarck on our starboard bow. She was a fire-spitting monster. Everything was coming at us, and she was illuminated. Awesome. This ship was just magnificent. She looked exactly like a battleship should. I mean, scary and everything, but just a beautiful ship. Once the attack has started, it's all about the pilot. The observer and the air gunner, well, we just stand by and get really excited watching what's going on. You're not thinking you're going to be killed. You're thinking you're going to hit this thing and that's it. The more you turn the aircraft around, the more chance they get to hit you. So we just went straight in. We got as low on the deck as we could and went straight. The Bismarck was on our port side and she just got bigger and bigger. The flak is bursting over our head well, above us, the small arms fire is pretty well all around us, and hitting us every once in a while, but we get in to drop the torpedo, do a quick turn away. Looking back, shortly after the turn, I see a large black and white explosion on the Bismarck. It's high and wide. Obviously, it is a torpedo hit. There's no other aircraft near us, so there's no doubt that it was the torpedo that we had just dropped. I tell Stan, and he grunts. He's busy doing various manoeuvres on the deck. I give a message to the air gunner that we've scored a hit. Milliner thought he'd seen something too. Right after the attack, the shooting stopped. We were in the clear. The last aircraft to arrive is the one with Charles' friend on board. She, that's the Bismarck, seemed to be in the middle of a slow turn to port as Tony put us into a shallow dive. He aimed carefully and dropped at about 800 yards from her port side. Bismarck turned violently away as the whole ship exploded in a flash of guns firing at us, as we did the best we could in weaving and jinking. I saw a column of water rise amidships on her side. The rear gunner, Pimlot, was firing his Vickers machine gun at the now distant Germans. Great splashes spurted up around us. I said, you ought to steer toward the splashes, they'll overcorrect and miss us. Bugger that, Tony answered, and forged on at about a hundred knots, and we were soon out of range untouched. Returning to Ark Royal, we flew low past Sheffield, giving her a thumbs up. At the debrief, we were discovered that we were not the only string bag to lose touch in the cloud. Our whole subflight had lost the leader. Tim Coode's leading subflight, with another aircraft from further back, had attacked first. Next, the other two of our subflight attacked after obtaining a bearing by radar, both being hit by shrapnel. The rest attacked in quick succession. Several other aircraft had been hit by Bismarck, but only two of the crew were badly wounded. The earlier crews had observed one other hit on Bismarck's starboard side aft and noticed her swing to port. The hit amidships did little damage, but the hit aft strikes the port side at the stern of the ship. The rudders are jammed by the explosion at 12 degrees to port. The ship begins to steam in a large circle the crew working frantically and managed to get the starboard rudder working, but the port rudder refuses to budge. With only three screws and one of those on the center line, there is not enough differential propulsion power to hold the ship on course using the engines alone. An idea is floated to blow the rudder off with explosives, but Lutyens dismisses this since the amount of explosive needed would run the risk of opening up shock damage caused by the torpedo strike and also more importantly, it would likely cause some damage to the screws. If that happened, the ship would be completely dead in the water. As night closed in, the Bismarck continued steaming in its large circle while Lutyen sending a final signal Ship are maneuverable. We'll fight to the last shell. Long live the Führer. Naval HQ sends back a series of messages, but it turned out that reading these messages, which praised the crew's upcoming doomed but valiant sacrifice, had a somewhat depressing effect on morale. Bismarck fired on Sheffield again, which withdrew to be replaced by five destroyers, which were ordered to keep contact instead. Despite all this, Lindemann decides Bismarck is not going to go quietly, ordering a signal to naval headquarters that her weapons and engines are intact even if the steering is not effective. He says they may be able to hold on until assistance arrives either in the form of Luftwaffe bombers, U-boats or even Turks to tow Bismarck to one of the French Atlantic ports. Vice Admiral Karl Dönitz has ordered all available submarines to converge on Bismarck and defend her. However, none are in range to reach the ship before the British catch her. Although U-556, commanded by Kapitänleutnant Herbert Wohlfahrt, crosses path with the Ark Royal and Renown. 
With no torpedoes remaining and the ships moving at speed, Wolford was left in impotent fury as he watched prime targets pass by and swiftly disappear. Although ostensibly assigned to keep an eye on the battleship, the destroyers become drawn into a prolonged active engagement, with various ships in the flotilla ducking in and out of gun range, with Bismarck salvos coming close but never landing a hit. The crew thus were kept at action stations throughout the night as star shells and torpedoes streaked in. No hits were reported as scored by the German crew, but the constant action drained them whilst ORP Pioron, a Polish destroyer that was part of the flotilla, trolled the battleship by flashing I am a pole at them with its signal lights, whilst firing with everything they had right down to the light anti-aircraft armament. An officer aboard HMS Cossack worries that the Polish ship might even try and ram the battleship, and observes, Pioron appeared to be working independently, and she was firing 4.7-inch guns and whatever other armament she had, going in and firing them off. They did daft things like that. They'd fight anybody. These attacks also have a useful secondary effect of draining Bismarck's ammunition stocks. As the primary and secondary batteries have already been in action several times during the voyage, the secondary battery especially begins to run down on its shell stockpile over the course of the engagement, with some theories stating that a few of Bismarck's secondary batteries would later run out of ammunition before being destroyed. As dawn rose on the 27th of May 1941, more and more British ships began to appear over the horizon. The weather was overcast with rain squalls and a fresh gale blowing from the northwest. The swell of the waves was somewhat high, and the British vessels observed that although Bismarck's fire control and main battery were still in good working order, her attempts to steer seemed to be largely fruitless, the strong wind pushing the ship back around when it periodically made attempts, presumably using the ship's propellers, to steer a course. This dictated the tactics. The Norfolk and the cruiser Dorsetshire were manoeuvring around to flank the battleship, whilst King George V and Rodney were ordered to close the range quickly by steering nearly straight for their quarry. Tovey stated this was to give the Bismarck the smallest possible target and get into closer and more accurate range for the main part of the battle, with the additional hoped-for effect of rattling the nerves of the exhausted crew at the sight of two battleships bearing down at them at full speed. The crew of Bismarck had been kept awake all night by the destroyers, whilst aboard the British battleships, their own gunnery crews had also been kept locked at action stations for much of the night. As the ship's speed varies between 7 and 10 knots and its own guns begin to train out, the last battle of the Kriegsmarine Schlachtschiff Bismarck was about to begin. <laughs> Zero seven oh eight hours, twenty seventh of May, and nineteen forty one. Admiral Tovey uses signal lights to send his tactical instructions and intentions to Captain Dalrymple Hamilton aboard the Rodney. Am changing course to look for enemy. Keep station twelve hundred yards or more as you desire, and adjust your bearings. If I do not like the first setup, I may break off the engagement at once. Are you ready to engage? Rodney acknowledges and surges forward, the engineers asking one last great effort from their straining engines. 0710. At German High Command, a signal comes from Admiral Lutyens indicating that he wants his war logs picked up by a U-boat as earlier attempts to launch one of the Arado float planes on this mission has failed, due to damage on one of the catapults caused days earlier in the Denmark Strait by one of Prince of Wales' shells. The nearest submarine is U-556, which is ordered to make a rendezvous, but her fuel reserves are too low. Instead, U-47, commanded by Captain Lieutenant Eitel Friedrich Kentrad, receives orders to proceed. 0847. HMS Rodney opens fire at a range of about 22,000 yards. Although much older than King George V, the issues that had plagued her 16-inch guns in her early years were mostly solved by now, and her all-forward turret layout allows her to bring her entire battery to bear at closer bearings than the newer home fleet flagship, although at the moment she's only firing with the forward two turrets. One minute later, King George V opens up with its own forward turrets. 
0849. Bismarck's first salvo in reply is fired aimed at Rodney using only turrets Anton and Bruno, the forward turrets, since the rear turrets Cesar and Dora could not be brought forward enough. Some steering was evidently still possible as Bismarck begins to turn to starboard presumably to bring the rear turrets into action. The British initially start a gentle turn to keep out of the arc of the rear turrets, but Bismarck's course alters back to port and instead Rodney begins its own turn to unmask its rear sea turret. King George V heads the other way as the British battleships split up. 0854. HMS Norfolk joins in the action with her 8-inch guns, whilst Bismarck's second salvo straddles HMS Rodney. Some splinter and shock damage jams one of Rodney's underwater torpedo tubes. As the shells plunge in, a young officer aboard King George V watches the sea around Rodney erupt. He is sure the other battleship has been hit, and it must surely be about to share the fate of the hood. Instead, the long silhouette of the battleship emerges from amidst collapsing shrapnel-laced geysers, its guns snarling 16-inch replies at the German battleship. Aboard Rodney, the lack of German shell hits is attributed to the ship's captain, who is observed to be making minor course corrections each time a salvo lands, often with the next German barrage landing roughly where the ship would have been if not for that slight alteration in direction. 0900. Bismarck switches fire to King George V as the range closes. The secondary batteries on all three battleships now begin to come into play and aboard the Bismarck several officers are keeping themselves busy trying to work out which shells are coming and which are going. The air is so thick with artillery that spotting the supersonic projectiles is actually becoming very easy. 0902 to 0912. Reports in this 10 minute period are quite confused as to what the precise order of events is, with different survivors and differing ship's logs all presenting the same events in slightly different orders. But what is clear is that in very quick succession the Bismarck takes a series of devastating hits. A 16 inch shell from Rodney lands squarely on the forward superstructure. The shell explodes, shredding the main fire control director along with several hundred men who were sheltering at the base of the bridge tower, as well as wiping out the bridge and almost certainly everyone on it, including Admiral Luchens and Captain Lindemann. Splinters from this hit also sever most of the fire control communication cables, leaving only the rear fire control station at the other end of the ship as the only one with the ability to seriously direct the ship's remaining guns, and this station is only able to communicate with the rear turrets. Another shell, some reports say from the same salvo, others claim fired shortly thereafter, is visually tracked by crewmen on HMS Rodney all the way to the front face of turret Bruno, where there is a flash of impact and moments later a colossal explosion as the several hundred ton armour plate that makes up the back of the turret exits stage right at high speed. The force of the blast apparently also disables turret Anton, which in any case now has no way of receiving fire control data from outside the turret. In the middle of all this, HMS Dorsetshire d joins in the action and a 5.9 inch secondary turret on Bismarck explodes from a hit of unknown origin. 0913. Fourth artillery officer, Captain Lieutenant Müllenheim Rechberg, has taken up responsibility for the main battery and directed four salvos from the aft guns against the King George V. But just as he feels he has the range, his station is knocked out by a 14 inch shell from his target. A heavy shell has torn the entire rangefinder array clean away, leaving only a hole in the cupola roof, a meter or so lower and the crew would have been gone as well. Turrets Cesar and Dora then direct their fire individually against HMS Rodney, who begins firing speculative torpedoes as well as unleashing every gun aboard that has the range. 0919. Bismarck is rapidly becoming a burning funeral pyre as repeated 16 inch, 14 inch, 8 inch, 6 inch and 5.25 inch shells hammer home. 
Fires are everywhere, jets of steam from ruptured lines are observed, and thick black smoke billows from a number of ragged tears in the ship. 0921. Dora is put out of action as one of its own shells detonates prematurely inside the right-hand barrel. 0925. Bismarck starts to show a distinct list to port, even as a heavy caliber shell tears off a large chunk of the remaining superstructure. Rodney and King George V are now circling their prey at point-blank range, with gunnery officers on Rodney observing 16-inch armor-piercing shells punching clean through the ship and into the sea beyond. The conning tower resembles a Swiss cheese, as the flattening trajectory of close-range action means more and more shells are smashing apart Bismarck's upper works rather than hitting the sides of the hull. But with the list increasing, there's obviously been some damage done underwater as well. 0927. Tarot Anton briefly comes back to life and fires one last salvo. 0930. From the gunnery director's position aboard HMS Rodney, a strange sequence of events is observed aboard Bismarck. One particular fella stood on top of B turret on Bismarck, waving his arms in semaphore. I saw this through my porthole and told the gunnery officer, Lieutenant Commander Crawford, and he says, uh, I don't want to know about any signal now. So then she flew black flag from the top of the yardarm, and that was, we want to parley with you. But Crawford wasn't having that either. So then she started blinking with her semaphore with her Morse lamps on the yardarm, four lamps at a time, and he said, I don't want to know, don't report any more of that. And so she was for it. Then we saw this fella semaphoring too, and just at that moment, a 16-inch shell hit the turret underneath him, and he just froze there. That was very sad, but it was her or us. At the time, the Bismarck's colours are flying, while some of her guns are still firing. Those attempting to surrender may have been taking unilateral action, as they are in parts of the ship that have been most vulnerable, most damaged, and communication throughout the ship is patchy and heavily disrupted, so they likely have no word from the surviving senior command officers. 0931. Tum Cesar fires its last salvo before taking several hits and being knocked out. Deep below, a rescue team tries to free sailors trapped in an ammunition magazine, but when raging fires threaten to trigger an explosion, the order is given to flood the space. Everybody within it is drowned, but it buys some time for the rest of the crew. What is left of the forward superstructure vanishes into a rising column of fire as flames begin to spread. A shell plunges into this inferno, and moments later, the main mast is seen to be toppling into the sea. 0940. The main battery has been silent for some time, but a handful of secondary guns are still active. Von Müllenheim Rechberg is telephoning through the ship to see who is in command, but can get nothing but deadlines, and men telling him they are evacuating their posts and fire or smoke overwhelm them. 0945. Bismarck is nothing but floating wreckage, but nobody strikes her ensign, the internationally recognized signal for surrender, Really, at this point, the flames and flying debris are so intense, it's unlikely anyone could, even if they wanted to. There is also no feasible way for the British to capture her. They expect Luftwaffe bombers at any moment, and U-boats are thought to be nearby. So, the British ships continue pouring in shell fire. The range is so short that the shells are leaving shockwaves on the water as they streak in and hit the side of the ship. Turret Anton is blown apart by a direct hit. Rodney's gunnery officer decides to fire all nine of his ship's 16-inch guns at once rather than in staggered salvos, a somewhat dangerous proposition as the shock could damage the ship beyond the cosmetic injuries they've already inflicted on themselves. For example, there isn't an intact plate or mirror for at least three decks below the turrets. Large sections of the ship's wooden planking over the main deck are splinters and memories. All nine shells that are fired are seen to hit the Bismarck, some going right through and skipping away over the ocean. But the German ship remains stubbornly afloat. 0952. 
Rodney fires another full salvo, this time scoring six hits. Glowing metal debris is sent flying through the air. 200 men trapped by warped hatches in the front canteen compartment are the victims of one of these shells, creating mountains of flesh and bone, according to one German sailor who comes across the scene later on. Rodney launches more torpedoes, and Dorsetshire closes in to do so as well. Sporadic 5.9-inch secondary fire is still coming from the German ship, but is hopelessly inaccurate. Rodney reports a hit, possibly two, with its torpedoes. If so, it has now become the only battleship to ever successfully torpedo another battleship in combat. Ten hundred hours. Aboard Ark Royal, a new wave of swordfish had been launched earlier to ensure Bismarck's destruction. They now arrive on the scene to report... It wasn't raining on the morning of the 27th, but the weather was still ugly, with the ship still pitching up and down, although not so much green water over the bows. The atmosphere was much more relaxed, almost carefree, which was down to the fact we'd all survived. Nobody had been shot down. We really did want to go in again. I think we wanted to get there before the home fleet did. Then we were delayed about two hours, partly because of the weather. As we approached Bismarck, the weather was better. We were at about 2,000 feet. Bismarck was surrounded by battleships, cruisers and destroyers. She was being mercilessly pounded. Her A turret was gone, and the after turrets were still firing. She was steaming about at about 7 knots, if that. The bridge was gone. There was just a big black hole billowing black smoke. She was a mess, and the gunfire was just ceaseless. Fearing these might be enemy planes, King George V's anti-aircraft gunners open fire on the swordfish, but miss. Hoping they can make a contribution to putting Bismarck under, the swordfish circle overhead, but are ordered to stay away. We asked permission to attack, and were told, no, we couldn't attack, that we should stay away. Now, why do you suppose that was? Well, there was no way the fleet air on with its torpedoes was going to sink the Bismarck. Tuvi was going to sink the Bismarck with guns. No aircraft was going to do it. It was really irritating, cruising around with a bunch of torpedoes still hung up and not being allowed to attack. The subsequent reason given was they didn't want us to be subjected to gunfire. There was no bloody reason the home fleet couldn't have stopped firing for a minute while we went in and attacked. First officer Hans Oehls ordered the men below deck that he could reach to abandon ship and instructed the engine room crews to open the ship's watertight doors and prepare scuttling charges, although the ship was at this point already noted to be sinking due to progressive flooding. Gerhard Junak, the chief engineering officer, reports that he ordered his men to set the demolition charges with a 9-minute fuse, but the intercom system broke down and he sent a messenger to confirm the order to scuttle the ship. The messenger never returned, so Eunuch primed the charges and ordered the crew to abandon the ship. 10.15 hours. The Bismarck is a wreck, without a gun firing, on fire, fore and aft, and wallowing more heavily with every moment. Men could be seen jumping overboard, preferring death by drowning in the stormy sea to the appalling effects of the continued gunfire. Some of Bismarck's hatches are so buckled and crumpled, men wearing life jackets cannot squeeze through. Many exits are reported, blocked by a struggling mass of men whom officers could no longer control. Those who do manage to make it outside aim to dash across the deck and throw themselves overboard. Blinded and choked by smoke and flames, some instead tumble through large shell holes into the inferno below. The smart ones wait until there is a momentary lull in the firing, and then make their bid to reach the sea. First Officer Oehls rushes throughout the ship, ordering men to abandon their posts. After he reaches the deck, a huge explosion kills him and about a hundred men. Wilhelm Wieck has managed to find himself at the aft end of the ship where there is a bit more control and hears an order given to abandon ship, stepping past glowing rents in the deck that seem to go down forever. He makes it into the ocean and swims desperately away as he hears the hiss of seawater vaporizing to steam with every swell of ocean against Bismarck's sides, indicating massive internal fires. Given what he has observed on his journey along the length of the ship, he doubts anyone could have survived to set demolition charges in the depths of the ship. Finally, one at a time, 
the British ships begin to cease firing. First Rodney, then Dorsetshire, and finally, six minutes later, King George V. 10.20. The shortage of fuel oil in the British battleships has become acute. It's not merely a matter of having sufficient oil to reach harbour. There is also the possibility of damage to fuel tanks by a near miss from a bomb or a hit by a torpedo, exactly the kind of damage that has sent Bismarck to France for repairs days earlier. And so a reserve is needed. As they break off, Tuvi orders any ships still with torpedoes to use them on Bismarck. Engineering officer Yunak and his comrades report hearing explosions that they assume are the demolition charges that detonate as they make their way up through the various levels. 10.22 Having received no orders to abandon ship but realizing Bismarck is done for, von Müllenheim Rechberg has waited until all the firing has stopped before leading his team out onto the upper deck to make their own escape. 10.26, Dorsetshire fires two torpedoes in one side, scoring hits before heading around to fire more torpedoes at the other side of Bismarck. 10.39, as Dorsetshire's next set of torpedo strikes home, the Bismarck begins to roll over and sink. Capsize, von Müllenheim Rechberg orders his men to salute their fallen comrades and then jump over the side. More than 700 men are in the water. Most of them will die. The swordfish from Ark Royal continue to circle powerless to assist them. The bow of the German battleship rears up out of the ocean and with a hiss of steam, the Bismarck slips beneath the waves for the final time. In the aftermath, some survivors who see HMS Dorsetshire closing to rescue survivors believe it is there to finish off anyone still alive. One member of the crew, Otto Peters, was washed off Bismarck's upper deck as the ship went down. The second wave took me out of the Bismarck. I tried to get away from the ship as quickly as possible and it was raining and stormy. But anyway, one tries to live. I tried to swim to this ship and I could see it very clear. The Union Jack, so it must be a British ship, and I thought, now they are going to kill us in the water. Coming closer to the ship, I saw they had ropes down, and so I thought to myself, now they are going to pick us up. Some German sailors, either misinformed or indoctrinated to believe the enemy will kill them rather than provide rescue, unfortunately swim away from Dorsetshire, while one officer shoots himself with a pistol. One of the men aboard Dorsetshire reports... We received a signal from the Admiral to collect survivors. We did it because they were seamen doing their job of work and we had done our job, which was to sink the Bismarck. We weren't far from Bismarck, in extremely close in fact, and scrambling nets and various bits of equipment were made ready to help get survivors aboard. There was no question at all in our minds that they were sailors who wanted saving. Well, of course, a county-class cruiser has got a lot of freeboard, so they needed quite a lot of assistance in getting up there. I saw quite a few of the Germans being pulled out of the water, but most of my time was spent delivering messages quickly and then back up to the bridge. A 10,000-ton cruiser like Dorsetshire has no anti-submarine detecting equipment and is a tempting target if you happen to be a U-boat. The first thing on Captain Martin's mind was the safety of his own ship, and there was a warning from one of the lookouts on the bridge that they'd, been, that they'd seen what was possibly some evidence, a sort of haze, of a submarine in the area. The captain turned around to me and ordered me to go and see the commander on the quarterdeck to tell him to throw all available rafts over the side. He would be getting underway immediately to clear the area. And that is what happened, although we were still able to pick up what survivors we could. I've seen bits in library books, and someone's actually underlined and made a comment, saying we left German survivors in the water, deliberately stopped picking them up. Captain Martin could not afford to risk his ship, and the Germans understood that. There were 750 men under Captain Martin's own crew that were very much on his mind. It is likely that what they spotted was U-boat U-74, arriving to pick up the war logs of Admiral Lutjens. Some sign of her was spotted by a lookout on Dorsetshire, 
which would sadly condemn many survivors to a slow death in the freezing waters of the Atlantic. Other U-boats arriving later and searching for survivors would find only wreckage and corpses. Those saved by Dorsetshire included Lieutenant von Mullenheim Rechberg. During the time the British cruiser was stopped, one of her own midshipmen jumped over the side to help wounded Germans scramble up the ship's tall sides. Another officer accounts, The captain gave him quite a good talking to. Of course, as Dorsetshire had to leave, he risked being left behind. Captain Martin told him quite bluntly he shouldn't have done it. He'd been trying to rescue a German who was badly injured and help him get out of the water, and fortunately he was able to get back on board before we left. U-74 would surface and pull three of the battleship's men from the sea, whilst the weather ship Sachsenwald also saved two of Bismarck's sailors. The destroyer HMS Maori picked up a further 25. Along with Dorsetshire's Hall of 86, that made 116 men out of Bismarck's 2,365 strong complement. One of the survivors aboard Dorsetshire died of his wounds and was buried at sea with full honours, although not with a Nazi flag, but rather the German naval ensign. However, out at sea, Wilhelm Wieck still had a lot of suffering to go through before he could reach safety. Our group was soon scattered by the ocean swells. The day was dawning to an end. The British ships disappeared on the horizon, in all directions, as far as the eye could see were pieces of floating debris. When night fell, only Hermann, who had worked in the engine room, and I were left, together in the water. The sea got rougher and the waves surged higher. Suddenly I realized that I had lost Hermann. There wasn't a sign of him anywhere. I panicked. I was cold and frightened. We had been trained to be ready to die for the fatherland, but at that moment the idea of dying a hero's death did not appeal to me at all. I wanted to live, even alone in the middle of a heaving, hostile black ocean. A stream of memories flooded my mind. I recalled my childhood in Recklinghausen, a coal mining town in North Rhine-Westfalen. I thought of my dear father, who was a miner, and of my mother, my sister, and my three brothers. When war broke out, I was enrolled in the Navy in Goldenhafen, where my military training started. When I embarked on the Bismarck, I was the only son left in the family. One of my brothers died from sickness, another one lost his life in the mine, and yet another was killed during the invasion of Poland. The cold brought me back to reality. There I was in the middle of the ocean. I felt a sudden urge to pray, for I did not want to die. Overwhelmed with a fear and aching all over, I remembered that my grandmother had taught me the Lord's Prayer. It was the only prayer I knew, and I repeated it incessantly during the night. As the hours passed, my fear subsided and calm came over me. When at long last day dawned, I was completely exhausted. The sea got rougher and I started vomiting. Then, overcome with fatigue, I began to doze and eventually went off to sleep. Another day dragged by with alternating periods of wakefulness and sleep. Then the second night set in. By then I was suffering severe thirst, my limbs were stiff from the cold and I started getting cramps. I thought that the night would never end. Dawn broke at last, bringing a third day. I fell into a semi-coma, losing all notion of time. And in that state I just made out the sound of an engine before I lost consciousness. He was found 75 miles away from the point where Bismarck had gone down. In total, the four British ships had fired more than 2,800 shells at Bismarck and scored more than 400 hits. Junak, who had abandoned the ship by the time it capsized, observed no underwater damage to the ship's starboard side. Von Mullenheim Rechberg reported the same, but assumed that the port side, which was then underwater, and was the side that had been engaged by the majority of the battleship's fire, had been more significantly damaged. In the end, it is impossible to say with certainty exactly what was the final blow to Bismarck, but it is clear that the ship was going down, albeit slowly, before the order for scuttling was given or the final torpedoes fired. Survivors' accounts also differ significantly depending on where they were in the ship during the battle. In the end, though, Bismarck was going down. Exactly which package of explosives caused it to sink at 10.39 hours, and not sooner or later, 
is, in the end, likely irrelevant. Back in the UK, the consequences of the battle ranged wildly. Admiral Tovey reported to the Admiralty, The Bismarck had put up a most gallant fight against impossible odds, worthy of the old days of the Imperial German Navy, and she went down with her colours still flying. Meanwhile, moves were made to court-martial Wake Walker and Captain John Leach of Prince of Wales on the grounds that they were wrong not to have continued the battle with Bismarck after Hood had been sunk. Admiral Tovey, horrified, got into an argument with his superior, Admiral Sir Dudley Pound, threatening to resign his position as commander of the Home Fleet and appear at any court-martial as the defendant's friend and defence witness. Rather unsurprisingly, nothing more was heard of the proposal. A British board of inquiry quickly investigated the cause of Hood's explosion and produced a report. But due to being such a rush job, it was pointed out that not all the evidence had been collected, and so a second board of inquiry was called, which also looked for similar weaknesses in other British capital ships in light of the probable causes of explosion. This board agreed with the first inquiry's conclusion that a 15-inch shell from Bismarck had caused the explosion of Hood's aft ammunition magazines. This led to refitting some older battleships with increased deck and magazine protection and other related improvements, but the precise cause of Hood's sinking remains a matter of hot debate to this day. With her notable performance against Bismarck, HMS Rodney would find itself kept on a short leash near the home fleet for some time as insurance against the emergence of the Tirpitz until, with the entry of more King George the Class. King George V class vessels and the United States of America into the war, she could be released to other duties. In Germany, Admiral Reda formally reported the loss of the Bismarck to Hitler in early June. Hitler asked why Lutyens didn't fight past the Prince of Wales to return to port the way she had come after the Battle of the Denmark Strait. Even if that resulted in the loss of the Bismarck, he argued, the British would have lost two capital ships. Reda admitted that seen in retrospect, a defeat of the Prince of Wales would have of course been a greater victory. However, Lutyens had to keep his operational orders in view as long as his ship were in a position to carry them, which meant attempting operation against merchant shipping if at all possible. For the Kriegsmarine, the sinking of the Schlachtschiff Bismarck was probably the worst single blow of the war. Shortly after, and as a result of Operation Rheinübung, the Germans would abandon the use of heavy surface warships against Atlantic convoys and concentrate that their efforts on U-boats, whilst Germany's capital ships would be staged end up in Norway, menacing Arctic convoys instead. The wreck of Bismarck was discovered in 1989 by Dr. Robert Ballard, who had previously found Titanic. The wreck rests upright almost five kilometers beneath the surface. This initial survey found no underwater penetrations of the ship's belt, although a good portion of this area was submerged under mud. Eight holes were found in the hull above the waterline. Ballard noted he found no evidence of internal implosions, which occur when a hull that is not fully flooded sinks. Whilst this suggests that Bismarck's compartments were flooded when the ship sank, it does not in fact provide direct support to either scuttling or gunfire theories, as there were plenty of holes in the ship that were repeatedly submerged before the ship went down, in addition to the various torpedo hits. So comprehensive flooding could have come from one, the other, or both sources. The hull of the stern has broken away roughly where the swordfish torpedo hit, raising questions of possible structural failures, which was a recurring issue in the sterns of a number of large German warships of the World War II period. Three subsequent expeditions have been conducted, each coming to different conclusions. The fact that a good portion of Bismarck's lower hull remains under mud doesn't help matters that much. Despite their differing viewpoints, the various experts involved generally agree that Bismarck would have eventually foundered, and any scuttling charges merely hastened the inevitable, although how much hastening was involved is of course something where the four expeditions have four different opinions, although Ballard notes, as far as I was concerned, the British had sunk the ship regardless of who delivered the final blow. And that concludes this very extended look at the first and last voyage of the Bismarck. 
look out in the next few weeks for further specials on Bismarck's design and construction, as well as an in-depth look on the possible causes for the sinking of the hood.